please join for the prayer for illumination. In the reading of your word, may we be given light to see. May your word rest in our hearts and minds, and in doing so, transform us into your faithful people. Amen. Please join for our scripture lesson, Isaiah 55, 10 to 13. We will read together. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Here ends God's holy word. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then 18 through 23. The part that is skipped is Jesus explaining to the disciples why he teaches in in parables. And here is one of them. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. He told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches it away, what is sown in the heart, this is what was sown on the path. And for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. And as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is God's word for God's people. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So what's with this farmer who's just so seeds, just flinging them willy-nilly everywhere, on the rocks, on the road, in the thorns, in the weeds, and, and, and on good soil? Seeds that are valued are carefully placed in the ground, unless you want to sow wildflowers, and then even then, you're not trying to throw them on the road. So let's dig in the dirt of this parable. It's interesting to preach on a parable that Jesus already explains, which is ironic, because in that first analogy, the, the seed that fall, falls on the, on the path is when people don't understand the word of God that is, that is given to them. And then he has, to de, de, he has to explain it to the disciples. So what does that mean? Because you would think they're a good soil, right? Which makes you wonder whether this par- parable, these analogies are not static, but variable. 
There are times when we are told the God thing, the righteous thing, what is the right path, the choice that ushers in the kingdom of God, and we don't do it because, one, we don't get it, we don't understand, that would be the path scenario, or there are times when we pledge that we're going to do the right thing, and then we fall away after a little bit, that would be the rock scenario, like me coming back from Christian camp when I was a kid, I'm going to read my Bible every day. How long did that last? Or I'm going to start a prayer journal or write a gratitude journal. I'm going to volunteer as a tutor or some other good deed that starts with every good intention, but then the enthusiasm for it falls away. Or sometimes we don't follow God's lead because we care too much about the concerns of the world, whether we're going to be accepted or shunned or we're worried about money, and that's the weed scenario. We have done all of these things. And let's not forget there are times when we get it right, when our beliefs, our words, and our actions are all in harmony and God is glorified. It's not either or. It's simplistic to think that people are either good eggs or bad eggs, which may be the temptation of this passage. And Um, Rather than eggs, Jesus would probably use the metaphor of trees or fruit, which he does throughout the Gospel of Matthew. He says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. He's saying that to the religious leaders, and which challenges any hearer of that to make different choices. Or he says, a good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bad fruit, or a tree is known for its fruit. But as a novice gardener, I know that when you see a plant or a tree that is, that is not thriving or is suffering in some way, you try to figure out what it needs. Is it too much sun or too little? Too much fertilizer, too little fertilizer, too little water? Or in the case of my zucchini plant this year, it's drowning. Again, depending on the context, the time and the circumstance, we can struggle or we can thrive. As a parent, and this is my, you know, my challenge with this passage, as a parent, if you're on your game, you learn to label the action and not the child. You, you don't say, you know, oh, you're a bad boy or you're a bad girl. You say, that was a bad choice. Right? That, that, was a, that was a bad choice. Can we think, you know, what would have been a better choice when we're on our game, right? Labeling children or people ignores the fact that we all have our moments. This passage would ask us, where in our lives are we not fully committed to the work of the kingdom? When are we plugging our ears, wanting to, not wanting to hear or understand? When are we or not willing to sacrifice? When are we too concerned about status or money? Shall we go back to the time of confession? because we, could all, we all have stuff that we can give over to God. But we can also celebrate, because there are times in our lives, things that we do, things that you are doing now, to which God is absolutely glorified. Praise be to God. So we could take this passage and just look at it, look at it as individuals, but we could also look at it as, as a church, as a community, and ask ourselves the same questions. And we will be convicted of our shortcomings and also be able to celebrate that which we do right. So applying this, and I've said this forever, the Holy Spirit is blowing, screaming at churches that they need to get outside of their church buildings to connect with people in the community. And there are a lot of churches doing this. La, 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 la. No, no. Like seed thrown on the path. Elizabeth Johnson in Working Preacher has an interesting application of this passage. She writes, too often we play it safe, sowing the word only where we are confident it will be well received, and only where those who receive it are likely to become contributing members of our congregations. In the name of stewardship, we hold tightly to our resources, wanting to make sure that nothing is wasted. We stifle creativity and energy for mission, resisting new ideas for fear they might not work as though mistakes or failure would be, were to be avoided at all costs. 
Jesus' approach to mission is quite at odds with our play it safe instincts, end quote. Which is another interpretation of this passage. What if we're the seed? That Jesus would just scatter willy-nilly out into the world, on the path, in the rocks, in the weeds, and in the soil, and call to proclaim the kingdom of God wherever we are. And sometimes we will be poorly received. We might be rejected, willingly misunderstood. And other times, people are going to come to know abundant life made known through Jesus Christ. They're going to learn to love themselves and love their neighbors as they come to love God. It's scary. But that may be the only way that some folks are going to hear about this loving God who sacrifices all for us, that we might know new life. Jesus, the sower, scatters us to the wind, hoping that in every time, in every place, we will show up with the word of God proclaimed in word and deed. Jesus says that in good soil, we will bear fruit. And what does that mean to bear fruit? It's, it's living out the gospel, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. And hopefully we don't need perfect conditions to do that. We are challenged all the time to learn to love in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And we are tested every day. I was on Facebook and I saw that a friend posted a poem and I thought, wow, that fits. And then I I looked at the source and it's actually a song by the rock band Rush which I would be curious to know if there are any Rush fans here, but I, um, I was not familiar with this song. But the lyrics go, the measure of a life is a measure of love and respect, so hard to earn, so easily burned. In the fullness of time, a garden to nurture and protect. In the rise and the set of the sun, till the stars go spinning, spinning round the night. Oh, it is what it is, and forever each moment, moment a memory and flight. The measure of a life is a measure of love and respect, so hard to earn, so easily burned, in the fullness of time, a garden to nurture and protect. Every day we make the decision to show up for God, which leads me to my last turning of the prism looking at this scripture passage, and I'm mixing my metaphors so I could say, okay, we're digging around the dirt a little bit more, and we find another tuber that, uh, that gives us joy. We just talked about proclaiming the goodness of God and the way of Jesus wherever we find ourselves. But each of us needs to learn what we need to do for ourselves in order to thrive so that we can show up for God in the world. What makes for good soil in our lives? Each of us create rhythms and practices that can contribute either to our languishing or our flourishing. And we have to adjust all the time because, again, we're not static, we're variable, circumstances are not static, they change. So I ask you this morning, what are you feeding yourself? What are you feeding your body? What are you feeding your mind? What are you feeding your heart? How much sun are you getting? Are you connecting with God in nature? How are you connecting with God? And I love this question. What do you do with the, with the manure that gets thrown at you? It can all be used to grow and help you thrive, and you can either resent it or transform it, which I think is another sermon. But all of this is to say that we need to be conscious of what makes for good soil around us and in us so that we can show up for God in the world wherever Jesus sends us. That is our call and tremendously satisfying when we know that we've made a difference in the world. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen.